Please welcome to the Goya Institute for Technology. I am Erica Olin Sapphire. I have the honor of being the president of the organization. And I have the even greater honor of being one of the research faculty here as well. So our motto is life without disease. Life without disease is very much an aspirational concept. But there's something behind it. Each day of our lives that we live in health without disease, or each day of our lives that we strive to return to health, we rely on our immune systems. And our immune system is what gives us all of our days in health without disease. The immune system has a central and controlling role in nearly every human disease. Not just the ones you might immediately think of, like infectious disease, but also heart disease, neurodegenerative disease, cancer, controllable cancer. It has a power and complexity that we are just now beginning to harness and understand. When we are sick and we go to the doctor, we hope that they will prescribe us something. But the doctor has nothing to prescribe unless a scientist has discovered it. And our greatest devastation is when that discovery has not yet been made. So for example, for autoimmune diseases, where we really don't yet understand some of the mechanisms, where we don't have treatments to offer. Or for viruses for which there are no vaccines, or there are only inadequate vaccines. But the greatest opportunity lies in the modern age and our ability to now understand, harness, explore, and wield the power and complexity of the immune system. So the immune system itself, like us, is constantly learning. It's constantly evolving. It is extremely complex, and it takes a large collaboration. In fact, a think tank of scientists in order to learn how to understand it and explore it. And whether you are new to us, or you're a lifelong friend, you know that that is where you are now. You're inside a think tank of the best faculty in the world for understanding and working together to understand how the immune system functions, how we can support its function, how we can inspire better function. We are on a mission here. And that mission is to build a world-class biomedical research program with a focus on the immune system. We focus on the immune system because it's the system that has the greatest power to keep us alive and well and healthy and to do all the things that are important to us. And we aim from this very small focused think tank, top five in the world, to make outsized contributions to the betterment of human health. So in legal speak, what we are is an independent nonprofit research institute. We are a 501c3, a tax exempt charitable organization. English, what that means is a think tank of rock star level scientists <laughs> with some of the best tools in the world in order to understand human health. The best thing about LGI, though, is not the legal speak, but this in the blue box. It's by scientists for scientists. LGI is led by scientists. LGI is focused on the science. LGI is small and lean and nimble and focused on whatever we need to do to improve the research and discovery of our faculty. <coughs> Another one of our key missions is in training the next generation of scientists. We have something very <coughs> special at LGI that doesn't exist at other institutes. And that's this program here, the Tully and Ricky Family Spark Awards for Innovations in Immunology. Through their gifts to the institute, the Tully and Ricky families and a hundred other donors now have contributed to sponsoring and lifting the research of our youngest and brightest scientists. So if you want to look at some of the numbers, from the five years of awards so far, $835,000 has been awarded to early career scientists exploring bold and innovative ideas. 32 awards have been given to these scientists representing 19 different laboratories at LJI. There are now 192 families that have contributed to this program from 450 gifts and pledges, having raised a little over a million dollars to support the best and brightest in the next generation. So that's the investment. But what's the return on the investment? Well, what these new scientists have created with those discoveries are now 11, the data that led to 11 new funded federal grants, $6 million in follow-on funding, 
Seven of them have now launched their own independent research laboratories. 40% of them have been promoted within the institute. There are four intellectual property filings, 12 new research papers already published and 20 more in progress. This year we have eight finalists for that Spark Award. And these are Eric Enninger, who studies cancer immunotherapy, Alba Grafoni, pandemic preparedness, Felix Nettersheim, a vaccine for atherosclerosis, Gregory Williams, the role of autoimmunity in ALS, Sloan Lewis, pediatric cow milk allergies, Rosa Isela Galvez, malaria and dengue, and David Zyla, who's got a project in monitoring immune competence. So you can see these represent the intellectual diversity of the Institute and some of our new scientists. And those in orange have posters outside. And you probably met some of them on the way in. You'll have a chance to chat with them again on your way out after the seminar. We invited Marco Riccione to speak tonight because he is one of those former Spark awardees. In 2019, Marco got through that Spark program seed funding to study heart disease. But what he found was something really inspiring. You know, we talked about the immune system has these tendrils that reach into nearly every other organ system. He found olfactory receptors, molecules involved in smelling and in scent, could actually sense volatile compounds released by high fat diets and stress linked to heart disease. Anybody out there have some stress? <laughs> this is a really important project. And so we invited Marco to speak tonight because it speaks to how the fundamental discoveries that our young scientists make can amplify into greater things. We have greater understanding about the function of the immune system and how we might use the immune system for the betterment of human health. I'm extremely pleased to invite Marco to come up and address us, and I'm looking forward to his results. Thank you. Well, can, uh, everyone can hear me? Uh, so thank you very much, Erika, for the very nice introduction, and uh, thank you everyone for being here. I would like to thank AJI for giving me, well, the opportunity to present um, my science, what I did uh, in the last five years, I would say. Uh, so today I will give you an overview of uh, what it was my Spark Award and uh, what we actually found. And so <clears throat> just to give you also a little bit of the introduction about me, so I, I am from Italy, as you can tell, I guess, and um, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, specifically I'm from Sardinia, that is uh, uh, one of the two biggest islands in Italy. And I did my bachelor degree in biology and my master degree in medical biotechnology at the University of Sassari in Sardinia. But I also started my PhD that was done uh, together at the University of Sassari as well as in Germany, in uh, Dresden, and also at the I was lucky enough to also uh, go for a period of time at, in Houston at the Rice University. Well, there I was studying um, a project that was in between immunology and chemistry, I would say. So I was studying nanomaterials, these very tiny materials that I guess you all know because, <clears throat> well, we get injected by a vaccine that was composed by lipid nanoparticles. And, well, I also studied the composition of these lipid nanoparticles and how they kind of impact, uh, how they impact the immune ce cells response. So let's say if you change the chemical characteristics, well, we can play around <coughs> and, and, and just play how the immune system respond to them. And that's basically what uh, I did. And I study, of course, not only lipid nanoparticles, but also their materials such as graphene and so on. But, <clears throat> well, uh, I was in this limbo, I guess, between chemistry and immunology, and immunology was always my dream. I was al wanted always to understand a little bit more of immunology, and that's why I was uh, lucky enough to join uh, the laboratory of Professor Klaus Ley here at uh, La, jo La, La Jolla Institute um, as a postdoctoral fellow. And so here, well, I started studying a completely different disease. And this disease is called atherosclerosis. I guess you most of, know, of you know what, what is atherosclerosis. Well, <clears throat> in a simple way, it's just the formation of lipid load and plaques in our arteries. 
And why is important? Because when the, these plaques get too big, I would say, or when there are complications, that's when you have, for example, heart attacks or strokes. And well, as you can see in this graph, heart diseases that includes heart attack and strokes are still the leading cause of death in the United States and worldwide. And of course, it was second for a while during the COVID pandemic. But now, as you can see, there is not much change, I would say, with the heart disease um, death, unfortunately. Nowadays, we have, I would say, several treatments that help us in trying to, try to fight this heart disease. And these are, for example, drugs that try to reduce the amount of lipids. You all know that cholesterol is bad, right? So the LDL cholesterol is always bad. And of course, reducing it with specific drugs, such as statins, is helpful. But unfortunately, it's not enough, because our immune system somehow mediates this response to several molecules that are also present inside this LDL, and they promote inflammation. And so I want to introduce to you the players. You, well, we are an, an immune, an immune uh, institute. And of course, these cells are well studied. I guess every lab here have their five favorite cells, I would say. Uh, there are T cells, lymphocytes, monocytes. Well, my favorite one is this one with the hat. It's called <laughs> macrophages. Well, macrophages, um, they're not present in the blood. They are normally present in the tissue. In the blood, we have another cell that is called monocytes that normally is the precursor. It's what actually gives rise to, the, to these macrophages. And the word per se tell a little bit about their function. Their function is the cleanup function. They like to clean up. They clean up stuff. And their name says basically they are big eaters, literally. And so why they are important? Well, because they drive the several diseases, autoimmune diseases, and of course also atherosclerosis. And here I just want to show you how they look. I mean, this, this is in our blood. And this is how cells look like under the microscope, more or less. So these are the red blood cells. This is a classical monocyte that is present in the blood. As you can see, this purple one is the nuclei, so the center of information of every cell. And the, the, the less violet, I would say, is the cytoplasm, so everything that you know, includes all the organelles and how the cells. And this is just to show you how they look like. And well, how we name them is mostly because of how they look like somehow. For example, this is a neutrophil, and because it has many nuclei, we call them call them polymorphonucleates because they have several nuclei. And this one have only a few. But it's just to give you an introduction of how the cells look like. So atherosclerosis. This is a normal artery. How I just wanted to introduce a little bit about the disease. So this is a normal artery. Of course, there are several layers. This is a vessel. Our arteries can be split in several layers. And this is how it looks like normally. There are, of course, many cells that play different roles. And this is normally how it looks like. Unfortunately, sometimes there is an accumulation of cholesterol, for example, or other substances, and that's when our cells from the blood go inside the first layer, and they become macrophages. The macrophages, what they do, they try to clean up. They try to remove the fat. They try to remove the cholesterol. But unfortunately, sometimes they are not able to do so, and that's when they kind of start to die because they cannot clear up well enough. And then they die. And when they die, of course, they release many substances that are kind of bad. And so they induce inflammation. And that's when there is a progression of disease. That's when the plaques became bigger. But this is not, not still is not actually the scary part when it's actually start to be dangerous. When it starts to be dangerous is when the top part kind of breaks. It's like when you actually cut your skin, I would say. There is the blood come out, and there is a formation of a clot, like a blood, blood clot. It's the same thing happens, but happens inside, inside your arteries. And so when this happens, it's dangerous because these thrombus can detach. And when it detached, it goes from a big vessel to a tiny one, block the blood, the blood flow, is that when you have stroke, when it happens in the brain, or when you have heart attack, when it happens in the heart. So this is the big problem of the disease. And so what we are trying to understand is how all this process is actually happening. So, of course, I, I don't want to stress enough, but what we eat is important, right? So we know that healthy diet, of course, allow us to probably have a better and longer life. 
And the junk food, well, it's good, but also it's known that might promote the formation of atherosclerosis. This is, I want you to do, this is uh, the image of an aorta. This is a mouse aorta, it's not a human one. And the white patches here is actually the plaques, how they look like under a microscope. So this is what we see most of the time working with uh, the animals downstairs. And so I want to introduce you to another aspect that is present in our body. And this is the, we are of course a uh, multicellular organism. We are made of many cells and everything. And inside of our body, there also lives many organisms, such as the microbes. We have our gut microbiota that is full of microbes, right? And they, of course, eat also what we eat, right? And they make several molecules. These molecules, there are so many, but some of them we call volatile compounds. Why volatile? Because they can normally are, well, easily present in the hair, and also they have a kind of a smell. We can sense it with our nose. And so these compounds are also known to promote the progression of this disease. What is not known is how this disconnection. And of course, the gut microbiota is important, but even the diet per se can mediate this. So I want to introduce you today of, well, there are so many volatile compounds, but today I want to introduce you about one compound that we discover in this lab, in, in, the, in the laboratory, and it's called octanol. This is a molecule that is normally has a kind of a fatty smell, kind of orangey fatty smell. To me, it's not pleasant, but it's also present in nature. And for some of these birds, for example, it's pleasant because they use it for mating season purposes. But what is interesting is that this molecule is also present in the bad cholesterol. And there are also quite high concentration of this uh, octanol. But the reason why we actually got interested for these specific molecules is that when we put mice, our you know, animals, I would say, uh, in a high fat or a low fat diet, is actually when we see that octanol levels increase in the blood of these mice compared to the one that actually have low fat, suggesting that the diet per se seems to mediate the increase of these molecules in the blood of these mice. And interestingly enough, if you remove the bacteria from this organism, and we call them germ-free, so basically they kind of are kept in a sterile condition, image like always living in a cage uh, that is completely sterile. And these mice have less, suggesting that part of this octanol might come also from the gut microbiota. But what we know now is that octanol is coming from a specific um, mechanism that is the oxi oxidation, oxidative stress that is happening specifically in the disease, and maybe some also from these bacteria in our gut. What is interesting is that if we inject this molecule inside the mice, well, and we look in the progression of the disease, that's when we saw that there is an increase of plaques. These red patches here are just the, the plaques, the atherosclerosis plaques that we can stain with a specific colorant. And then we can measure them, and we can see whether there is a difference in lesion size. As you can see, the controls one, the one that didn't get octanol, have, uh, they have still some plaques because these are models that normally develop the, the disease. But then when you inject these molecules, then there is a high levels of octanol. So this suggests that this octanol is doing something, but what is actually, how is mediating this one? Well, that's when actually these olfactory receptors came in. So in, the, in our body, we have a beautiful system that allow us to detect everything that's around us, even now, I guess. So, and this is the olfactory sensory system. And how does it work? Well, there are specific cells that are neurons that are present in our uh, nose. And at the end of them, let's say in the extremities that are outside our nose, they have specific detectors, I would say that are called olfactory receptors. These small molecules here, they detect whatever is in the surrounding, of course, but, and they give the, us the sense of smell. And this is, well, when they discovered them in 1999, it was thought that these were only present in the nose. And so, but now we know that this is not actually the case. These olfactory receptors are present everywhere in our body. We have evidence that these olfactory receptors are everywhere. But we don't know yet 
what are they doing in most of these organs. But still, they are there. So I think uh, by evolution, not mostly nothing is casual. <laughs> so they should, they're doing something over there. What is still, you know, we still don't know. But what is also interesting, and here I'm showing you, well, don't, uh, don't get scared by this one, but it's just, <laughs> basically it's just showing you, the red one is showing you high expression and low is low expression. And here we just compare several macrophages in different tissues. And the first two are in, our, in the aorta. We call them vascular because they're present in the, in, the, in the vasculature. And compared to other macrophages, well, we could see high level of expression of several olfactory receptors. And interestingly enough, the first one on the top is called olfactory receptor 2 that is a known receptor for octanol. And so this is, of course, what's interesting because what, what this receptor is doing here, and because we have seen that octane is maintaining this effect, well, we wanted to understand how it worked and also whether it was actually real expressed in the arteries and in the aorta. So thanks to our beautiful uh, imaging core here at the GI, we actually took a very nice picture of a mouse vessel, and the green one is the olfactory receptor 2, and the magenta is showing the macrophages. It is basically stained with a specific molecules that only is present only in macrophages. And so what it shows here is that these receptor is specifically present in the macrophage in the aorta. And here it's just showing basically magenta and green together become white. So that's the co-expression is highlighted here. And this is, I want to show you a nice video that I really enjoy. This is a piece of a uh, a vasculature, and this is basically all the cells that are present in the vessel. And here I'm just showing you a kind of a zoom in. In the magenta one are still the macrophages, and just showing you how there are different cells in our in, in our in mouse uh, vasculature that actually express this receptor. So, suggesting what actually it's it's doing there. And here I just wanted to show you this beautiful picture that is actually was made by Bill Kiosis. And it just show you how the different layers of a vessel, how they is done. Basically, these are muscle cells, smooth muscle cells. And on top, you see a macrophage is green because it's expressing a olfactory receptor. And it just, I just like this image so much. And, then, and I wanted to also show it to you as well. So, but. Another uh, an interesting thing is that what is nice of this receptor is that not only we know the ligand, what is actually activating this receptor, but we also know that there is a natural blocker of the receptor, something that blocks the functionality of this receptor. This is very, very helpful, actually, because we can study the functionality of it. And this is called citral. This molecule is present in lemons, also in lemongrass oil, and so on, in high concentrations. And so, well, what we did, we tried a very simple experiment. We, as we did before, we injected the mice with, instead of with, with octanol, with citral, to see what happened. And well, the mice that received the citral have had less lesion size, as you can see from the picture here of the aorta, as well as the data that are just quantified. So there is a decrease. Well, we are, we, this suggests that this maybe this olfactory receptor actually was important for the progression of the disease. Well, but it's never enough in science. Of course, we want to be sure that it's something is, is what it is and is doing the function properly. And to do so, we used new technology that I know, don't know whether you are familiarized with, but that use CRISPR-Cas9. This new technology allow us to target a specific gene that we like in, a, in an organism. And can, we can basically delete it, remove it from the organism. Of course, we do that in, in mice, right? We cannot do it in so we did that, and we removed from the mouse this olfactory receptor 2. And we call it knockout, because we can knock out the gene from this, from this organism. And then what we did, we put this mouse on a high-fat diet, so boosting the progression of the disease, because we want the, to see whether there were differences in the progression of the disease. And luckily, uh, interestingly enough, and also luckily enough, we found that there was a clear decrease of the lesion size in the mice lacking these olfactory receptors. And so, of course, this is quite, was quite interesting. Well, I don't want to, of course, to go too much into details here, but what I wanted to, um, to just 
take from this slide is that <coughs> there are several substances that play a role in this disease. And we tried, we wanted to uh, understand why this olfactory receptor was actually mediating the functionality that we've seen. And one of the biggest and most important molecules in atherosclerosis that promote this inflammation is called IL-1 beta. It's a, it's, a, it's a molecule that is highly pro-inflammatory. And of course, recall all the cells and so on. And so what we did, well, we studied, we found that the ligand, when octanol get recognized by the olfactory receptor 2, well, we saw an increase of this molecule. And this molecule being highly pro-inflammatory, recall other cells and promote the progression of the disease. Blocking it by the use of this inhibitor that is called citral, or by, of course, removing the gene from the organism, well, we saw that actually there is a decrease of these molecules, possibly preventing the progression of the disease. So this is, of course, very, very cool. And, and we found that in mice. But the re well, you all know that mice are not <coughs> humans. They work differently. So of course, this wasn't enough. We wanted to understand whether this receptor is also functional at present in humans. Well, but studying humans is not so easy, as you, can <laughs> as you, as you might think. So we were lucky enough that we got a piece of a human aorta from a surgery. And we, thanks to our collaborations in Germany, and we found that also macrophages, these cells, these magenta cells in humans do express these olfactory receptors. That in humans is called OR6A2, because we never like easy things. We always like to change names. So <laughs> in mouse, it's called olfactory 2. In humans, it's called OR6A2. But it's the same thing overall. So this is just to show you that, yes, we also we have it in humans. And we have it in humans aorta. And this is just a video in which I, I kind of I was doing the, 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 the imaging of these uh, cells in the aorta. And I'll just show you the green is these olfactory receptor present in these cells. And now it's going to pop up basically the magenta that is showing that these cells are actually these big macrophages and so on. So of course, we are excited. And another thing that is very exciting for me, and this is actually very new, is that analyzing the blood of people that are healthy or have cardiovascular disease ongoing, well, what we did, we checked on these cells that are called monocytes. Monocytes, as you remember from the beginning, are only present in our blood. But they are the precursor of these macrophages. So they actually give rise to macrophages. And when, what we found is that in monocytes, the people that actually have uh, obstructive disease, so very advanced atherosclerosis progression, they have more levels of these octanal receptors in humans. And the other interesting thing is that octanal, this molecule, is present in all of us, always, I would say, but in different concentration. But when it changed? When it changed when, for example, we have high cholesterol or when we have LDL cholesterol in our blood. So there is this correlation between the concentration of octanol and the, um, and the I would say, atherosclerosis normally um, mm, associated um, lipids and so on in our blood. So this is actually make us believe <coughs> that these olfactory receptors are very important also in humans. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, of course, we cannot remove a gene from a human body. But we can do it on cells. So we take a small cells from, a, from, a, from the blood, and we can remove a gene there. We can play around with that. And that's what we did. We basically removed this olfactory receptor. And then we checked whether the functionality of these cells was maintained. And interestingly enough, checking these molecules that I told you before, there was a clear reduction when we removed from the system these uh, OR68, these olfactory receptor from the cells. So these make us believe that these receptors are present in the blood, they're present in monocyte, they're present in macrophages, and also that when we treat them, when they recognize octanol, they mediate inflammation. And this can happen also in humans. And the same thing is that when we block, if we block it, then we can also think that we can block inflammation and possibly we can also prevent the progression of the disease. So this is overall 
what we think and what uh, we found so far. And of course, it's, it's complex. We see that you know the LDL, the diet, promote octanol. There is, of course, mediate this activation, but still, we are there are so many questions now that need to be answered. And one of these questions is, for example, there are others. Or we found or we studied one receptor. There are more that actually have similar functionality. And the second question is, can we target them to actually prevent the progression of atherosclerosis in humans? Well, we can start to answer to some of these questions. The first one is, yes, there are so many receptors that are present. And some of them are also having a similar functionality of these olfactory receptor 2 that we found. And what we are doing right now is that we are studying most of them, and we are trying to understand what they are doing. And I, the other thing is, can we target these receptors? Well, these receptors have a specific structure that is very common in our body. And they are called G-protein coupled receptors, just the name that they give them. And these are basically have seven pieces that goes inside the membrane, I would say. And so that's why they're called GPCR. But they were just to remember the name, just because they are very important. And well, we know that we can target them with citral. Citral blocks this receptor, blocking the functionality. The problem of citral is that these molecules is not is a natural compound that, yes, is good, but is not highly specific. So in a when we want to develop a drug, of course, we want something that is highly specific for the receptor that we want to target. And so that's what is going to happen next. But, and then what hopefully we're going to do next. But I want you to do this with the GPCR because, as I mentioned in the beginning, this is a factory receptor. No one ever thought about studying them outside the nose, ever. They were like, yeah, they are in the nose. They do their stuff in the nose. They don't do anything else. But they are the half of them of this big family of the receptor. Half of them are for mediating the olfaction. The other half is hormones and other <coughs> phase and so on that actually play a very important role in, in our body. They, they control several tissues. They control the functionality of our immune system. They control ev many things correlated to our life right now. And so it actually makes me wonder that why so many, so much of these receptors were not studied, you know, before I would say. And I mean, it's good because I, I am doing that right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, and here I just want to introduce you that uh, another thing that FDA drugs are so far, most, at least 40% of the drugs approved in the market right now, I mean, this is 2016, but even more right now, are actually in this category, in these GPCRs. So this make us think how much actually this is still, still to be done. We are here. I just understand a little bit that these receptors are there and they're doing something. And that's what we are, what are trying to prove you and convey to you today, that they're doing something and they're important for the health and for the progression of atherosclerosis. But they might be important for all the diseases, just that we don't know yet. And as science works is that when you understand something, then you're going to have thousands of questions more. So you're going to have more questions coming. And I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm sure that's going to be more and more questions also when we, when we go piece by piece uh, further. <coughs> and so with that, actually, I would like to uh, say that, as Eric mentioned at the beginning, well, is science is not a work that we do alone. And uh, it's always teamwork. And I would like to thank, first of all, my mentor, uh, Klaus Ley, uh, that, uh, and of course also all the other lab members that are very valuable. And that's something that uh, I just want to say that in the pandemic, I missed a little bit the discussions, the random discussion with the lab members <coughs> that in my opinion are so important because in the random discussions that actually you have ideas that can move forward. So I don't know, I may, I may be, <laughs> I, still, I, I, I think Zoom is useful, but still the human interaction is uh, very helpful. That's why it's very nice to see everyone here. And, and, and then I would like actually to thank the histology core, the microscopy core, and the flow core. All the cores here at LGI are so fantastic, and they actually make us do these great things that we cannot do otherwise. And then the other collaborators all over the United States and also in Germany. And finally, of course, the funding. I would like to thank the American Heart Association that 
uh, funded my postdoctoral uh, fellowship as we are now, my moving forward in the career development award. The Conrad Premise Foundation, that also allowed me to move a little bit more into the human part and study a little bit more about this olfactory receptor. And then I would like to thank the SPARC. Well, the SPARC was the beginning, I would say. Uh, it actually <coughs> came in 2019, so I started, uh, well, we submitted in 2018, I would say. I, I started this project I th at the beginning of 2018. So it's a long way. And the SPARC gave us actually the, uh, me, the confidence, I would say, to try something that was never known. Sometimes in science we say that uh, there are these projects that are high risk, high gain, I would say, right? So it's very risky because there is nothing about that, but then can be very important. And that's what, um, what it is right now. And I also would like to conclude saying that, well, I we finally accepted also a position in uh, at university in Georgia, and I will be starting my own laboratory, uh, in where in which I hope to study a little bit more about this olfactory receptor and to understand a little bit more about that. So, thank you very much, <laughs> and uh, thank you. I'm ha very happy for. I'm sure Marco will be happy to answer any questions. Many things, I would say. <laughs> uh, right now, I even don't know many things, so it's, I think it's always <laughs> like that. Um, <coughs> what I know, well, um, when I started, it was just a, by coincidence, I would say. So I came in the lab, and what happened is that we, I had, um, we were studying right atherosclerosis. We were studying these macrophages thing because I, that's what I actually like to study, right? Uh, so we were there, we were studying them. And we found this big family of receptors there in, the, in our data. We're like, what they're, what they're doing there? I mean, why, why they're there? I mean, they're not supposed to be there. <laughs> they are in the nose. <laughs> why they're there? <laughs> and so nothing. We just, <laughs> I didn't know anything. And so I just started to study, learn a little bit about that. And well, after so many trials and errors, we started to understand. Actually, I was saying before um, today, that uh, today I'm t I told you a story. Well, science and also my science doesn't really work as a very you know, <laughs> nice story. It's always like bumpy and you're there and then you go here and then over there. So it's, it's, uh, it's always, you know, you try uh, an hypothesis and if it works then piece by piece you make actually together a story. And uh, so, and nowadays uh, the other interesting thing is that you, you, you learn one thing, but then you don't know many others, and so you continue like that. So it's not, you really, you learn something, but you never really uh, can know everything, right? So that's how, why it's fun, I guess. Other questions? I saw something very tantalizing in your slides. I saw lemongrass and I saw cinnamon. Is it <laughs> as simple as putting lemongrass in our stir fry and cinnamon? <laughs> <laughs> Have you looked at, in this mechanism that you've described, what it is about them that allows or causes the endothelium to fail? Mm. Because that, that's the key to heart disease, is that the endothelium <coughs> allow uh, foreign uh, penetration into the, into the blood vessels. So is there something unique about this that causes that to happen? <coughs> well, uh, I guess uh, we didn't, in, th in the study we did, uh, we didn't check the, um, um, the composition per se of the stability of the plaque. And, and that's only because in mice, um, well, it's funny enough, but mice, they never die of atherosclerosis, even though they have huge plaques, but still, they do not. And that's probably because there are different mechanisms in humans that happens. But of course, inflammation is driving the ruptures also of the endothelial. And, uh, and macrophages play a role in that. And so if we can, um, in my view, of course, this is right, 
uh, if we can block these specific mechanism, if actually there is a reduction of atherosclerosis, then I th what they think is that there's going to be a switch in the atherosclerosis instead of the repair of the tissue. So when there is a repair of the tissue, the plaque somehow also the cap of it becomes stronger, so there is less likely to rupture. Is actually when you then have less likely to get an event, an atherosclerosis like a stroke or whatever. So of course everything in this sense is correlated. And I would say there are uh, those scientists that study specifically this process. So, uh, but yeah, the, I hope of course it's interconnected also to that. Uh. First of all, thank you for the talk. That was very well presented. I enjoyed that. Uh, I'm wondering if, in using your knockouts, you looked at some of the downstream genes that are turned off, and if maybe some of the drugs that we know that impact some of those <coughs> molecules might be other targets that we could use here. Right. Right. This is actually a very good question. Well, um, we um, we looked at, of course, there are when you knock out this gene, also all the signal. Well, I didn't introduce you here all the mechanisms, I would say, in details. But of course, when these receptor <coughs> get detect octa, there is a so long pathway that, a so long, several molecules that get together and do stuff, I would say. Uh, so they get activated, there is all these signaling that then mediates the R1 beta that I introduced you before. And of course, when you remove it, then there is also a decrease of that. But it's true that if you also target some downstreams, then there is a similar effect. That's something that we, we did. We also block, remove, let's say, uh, some downstream with drugs or, you know, um, let's say, removing the gene, I would say. Um, then in that, in, in that particular case, we can, we can see a reduction also of the progression of the disease, of the activation of the receptor. So yes, you can also target some specific downstream. And <coughs> what actually I think the, the, my goal would be in the future would be to screen. Initially, normally, this kind of screening is, as I mentioned, because there are so many drugs targeting these receptors, the first one would be to, to try to see whether available drugs somehow affect also this, this mechanism that we've seen. And if that happens, it's much easier, because then you can, it's already approved, so you can you know, go faster. Uh, so that this is the first step that we are going to do. Yeah. Also, thank you. Fantastic presentation. You mentioned at the top of your remarks that stress was a component to you know heart disease. So, is there any way to really quantify that, or is it really uh, you know dependent on the individual? Uh, is there any way to really say, okay, you know, X percentage of your heart disease is, is due to uh, too stressful of a life? <coughs> well, um, <laughs> I don't have an answer for that, but um, uh, I don't know whether it can be quantifiable uh, because I stress and humans, uh, we are so diverse between each other, so um, what is stressful for me might be not stressful for another person, maybe. And so that's, and I, I mean, stress, of course, is a component that can, but what I, what I meant about stress is actually um, something that happened in, 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 cell, in the cell. So I call oxidation, oxidative stress and so on. That, of course, can be also mediated by our personal stress. There are studies um, that, well, in, in mostly in these studies also in, in, in rodents, I would say, that they stress them out like uh, also avoid them to sleep or sound. And it, this shows that there is an increased production of immune cells from our, let's say, uh, um, bo bone marrow. So there is a lot of immune cells that comes, and there is a high levels. And so of course, when you have these high levels, there is most likely also to get inflammation, and it's most likely also to get autoimmune disease and as well as, you know, atherosclerosis. So I, I, I really believe that stress is, of course, a component of our uh, day life. But quantification, well, <laughs> I, I don't know about that. <laughs> Thank you. Of course. Hi, Marco. Hi. Since, since you pointed out that these olfactory cells are widely distributed throughout the body, is this sensing or sniffing mechanism responsible for a lot of different kinds of immune responses? 
um, and is that becoming more <clears throat> that, generally thought and perhaps a target of treatments? That's what I think. Uh, it's very far away to become a target for treatments, but that's my, um, <coughs> that's what I believe, I would say, that's my, and I think now um, even the scientific community is starting to understand that uh, these receptors are important, I would say, and so, um, and, and yeah, and I, I, I think there are also, they're imp really important also in cancer program, um, in cancer and so on, um, of course, uh, there are some studies that shows different functionality, some functionalities also in other organs, such as they control the blood pressure in the kidney, somehow responding to some molecules. But I think there is still a long way to go. So it's, uh, it's, it's very in, the, in, in its infancy. Uh, but it's exciting, I would say, because it's, uh, it's something that, you know, um, uh, something new. And it's a new concept also. And I think there is many... Um, Many things that needs to be done, and uh, hopefully will will bring something good. I would say, uh, in a therapeutic purpose that can be helpful in atherosclerosis for what I'm studying right now, but maybe maybe other diseases. Uh, that's actually what I would like to explore a bit more in the future, and even cancer. I would say. Any other I haven't met. My name is Kelsey. It's nice to see you all here today. This is our first Life Without Disease event in three years, so we're really happy to have you all back here and engaging with our scientists. Um, we'd like to invite you to uh, join us for a reception out on our back patio. We'll have heaters, um, <laughs> refreshments, and some snacks. And as Erica mentioned, some of our SPARC finalists for this year are going to be out there, and we encourage you to engage with them, hear what they're working on. I'm sure you'll be inspired by them. Um, and I just want to close by saying we're so grateful for all of you for your interest in what we're doing, for your support for what we're doing. A lot of our research is powered by philanthropy, and many of you in this room are supporters, and so thank you. And if any of you have any questions about how you can give, ways you can give, I'm here to answer any questions, and so is my team. Um, and I think.